Today's message is something of a Bible study about the Feast of Tabernacles. It was prompted by Mr. Armstrong's article, which appeared in the most recent international news about the Feast of Tabernacles, and raised a line of thought that I hadn't followed before, and so I thought it might be interesting today to take a little time to look at this concept of Tabernacles, Feast of, and learn a little bit from it. The word is a funny word, tabernacles. Uh, I noticed in uh, the latest international news, also an article by David uh, Nix, which I enjoyed very much, uh, talking about convictions and developing convictions. And one of the things he urged people to do was, instead of saying you're going to uh, on a vacation this autumn, tell them you're going to the Feast of Tabernacles. Come right up front and say what it is. Well, when you do, you get the chance to explain the meaning of this word, tabernacle. Have you ever looked it up? Believe it or not, I hadn't. I had never, ever pulled down an English dictionary and looked up the word tabernacle. It, you will find in the definitions listed there nothing that isn't biblical. In other words, it is a biblical word. There is no secular use for the word tabernacle. Uh, you don't, you know, you have a Mormon tabernacle choir, but their idea of a tabernacle is derived from the Bible. Every use of it is derived that way. The word itself is neither Hebrew nor Greek, tabernacle. It comes from Latin, possibly from the Vulgate version of the, of the Bible, I suppose, is where it, it was derived. The word is tabernaculum, and it is the diminutive form of taberna. Taberna has a funny little sound to it. It means hut or shed. This is the meaning of the Latin word, taberna. A tabernaculum is a little hut or a little shed. What's interesting about it is that that is also where we get the English word tavern, because B and V are often interchangeable. A tavern or a taberna was a place, a shed or a hut, where you went to have a drink. I hope no one will confuse the upcoming feast with the Feast of Taverns, uh, there is no connection between the English derivation of this word and the origins of this festival, which had its origins, of course, in the Hebrew language, not in Latin. The King James Version poses some problems. When you settle in to get your concordance out and try to study tabernacles, you run across a variety of, of uh, words that come from the same origins. And then on the same time, for example, you will find of the same Hebrew word, you will find tabernacle, booth. Uh, there's one called, I think, zophon, which is translated as a, like a place. There are some curious variations from the Hebrew word into the English. And then when you look at the, you make your way through the Bible looking at the word tabernacle in the authorized version or King James Version, you will find, well, you won't find. What you'll find is tabernacle, and what you won't know is that there are at least three separate Hebrew roots, six different Hebrew words, that the King James translators thoughtlessly translated tabernacle or tabernacles. And that's not terribly helpful. Now, to solve the problem, the easiest way for you to solve the problem is to look at the Revised Standard Version or the uh, New American Standard Version of the Bible. These, in every case, make the switch between three different ways that, this, that this, the, these three words are, should be translated. One, they translate tabernacle. Now, what that is, in simple terms, what the, the reality of the word is that inside the original uh, place of worship of God, I would call it that initially, that when they came out of Egypt, and God had them make for him a tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, though, was not the entirety of the enclosure in which the worship of God was carried out, technically. The word tabernacle refers only to what we refer to or would compare to in the temple, the Holy of Holies. It was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. Actually, it was, unlike the rest of the tabernacle, it was not a tent. It was actually made out of boards, probably out of uh, paneling, to tell the truth, but because the, the, the word actually could mean a panel or a board. And it was made out of, the, it tells you the number of boards that go in the sides, the number of boards that go in the ends, and how they're all attached to things and, and built. So they actually constructed the tabernacle out of paneling. Now, outside of and above the tabernacle was the tent. Unfortunately, in the King James Version, the word for tent is often translated tabernacle as well. And so you don't realize the distinction that is there. 
Once in a while, they will make the distinction when the two words crop up in the same verse. They will use tabernacle and tent. Other places, tent is sometimes translated as tabernacle. But the Revised Standard Version and the, and the New American Standard Version use the terms tabernacle and tent exclusively where they belong, so you can tell where you are. Now, there's a third word. The Revised Standard Version for this word uses the word booths, as does the King James Version. On the, but sometimes for this word, King James also uses tabernacle. But the word booth in the Hebrew, uh, the word that is translated booth, comes from a word which basically means hut or shed, just like the Latin word tabernaculum and consequently the word tabernacles. We refer to it as the Feast of Tabernacles, working our way back through Latin to the Hebrew to describe what is essentially the Feast of Huts. Because when the Bible begins to describe the festival, it does not use the word tabernacle, it does not use the word tent, it uses the word for hut. Now, I want you to turn back to Genesis to the first use, actually, of the word in the Bible. In Genesis, the 33rd chapter, Jacob is returning to his home, and he's going to encounter his brother Esau, and he fully expects Esau to be furious. He expects Esau to be ready to take his head off, which, in fact, may have been the case initially. And he develops a scheme, a way of meeting with Esau and sends first on a gift, one gift, and then another, and then another, a whole wave of gifts. So that when he finally meets Esau, he has been somewhat softened up. And finally, whenever their encounter is over with, we're told in verse 16 of Genesis 33, Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed into Succoth and built him a house and made booths or huts for his cattle, Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth, and the word Succoth means, guess what? Huts or sheds. He came in there, built a bunch of sheds for his cattle. They named the place Sheds. And from that time on, that's what it, how, how it was called. Now, this gives you, included simply to give you an idea of what the word means. It's a, it's a shelter. It's not necessarily a tent because the word for tent is a totally different word. When you take skins or fabrics, and poles and rope and put them together into a structure to provide shelter for yourself, the word for that is tent. In the Hebrew, when you actually use something, and by the way, the root underlying the word for hut, uh, in this case, has to do with interweaving things or thatching. So the idea is where you take leaves, branches, uh, and plant materials, and you get together and you construct some sort of shelter out of these things a hut, a tabernacle, a booth. So this is essentially what it means. Now, if you'll turn back with me to Leviticus 23, with this in mind, and consider the original instructions as to what they were to do and why they were to do it. A particular interest to us here is going to be why they were to do it. In Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 34, actually verse 33, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. Read it, the Feast of Huts. For seven days unto the Lord, on the first day is a holy convocation. You will do no servile work therein. He goes on with the discussion of the offerings that were to be made. In verse 39, Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath, and you shall take to you on the first day the boughs or the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord seven days. What are you supposed to do with all these tree limbs? Well, read on. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord seven days in a year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month, you shall live in huts seven days. All that are Israelite born shall live or dwell in huts. Why are you doing this? Well, you're doing it that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. That is, to dwell in huts. I am the Lord your God. 
Now, the, the, the name Feast of Huts, and of course, the, the way it was expressed in Hebrew would have been much like that, and at least it would have sounded that way on their ears, would have been extremely meaningful if you had been able to be there at the time. For the view from a high point of the Mount of Olives where you could see out across Jerusalem and around the land to the, to the east, the north, the west, and the south was nothing but one hut after another, just little places, little campgrounds that people had put up where they, and probably in many cases, used tents as opposed to using boughs of goodly trees because you wouldn't do that very many years with that many people coming, and there wouldn't be any trees to make huts out of any longer. So I'm sure early on they had to make a, a decision regarding how they made these things and where they were going to live and what the circumstances would be for ecology. You get a million people in and around Jerusalem taking boughs and branches of trees to build huts with, and you have got a problem. Now, one short digression at this point. He said, you shall keep it seven days forever. You shall dwell in huts seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in huts. So far, so good. Who is to do it? Everybody that's Israelite born. But now, bear in mind the why. In order that you may remember and know that I made you dwell in huts when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, keeping that in mind, pass with me over to Zechariah, the 14th chapter, because there is a question here. How do we explain this passage in the light of the who and the why of the original commandment? Because you will find people quick to tell you, if you say you're keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, oh, well, that's for Jews, and it's a Jewish festival. And after all, it says in the original instructions, all that are Israelites born. And if I don't believe I'm an Israelite born, well, then there's no need for me to keep the Feast of Huts, as you might be thinking of doing. In Zechariah 14 and verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Huts. All of the nations. Now, does that mean just Israelite nations were warring against God? Listen, it shall be that whoever will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king of the Lord of hosts, there shall be no rain. If the family of Egypt goes not up and come up that have no rain, there will be the plague that the Lord will smite the heathen. Heathen means pagans. It means people of other nations. It means Egyptians. It doesn't mean Israelites who will first of all have drought, second have absolute plague, if they don't come up to keep the Feast of Huts, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the punishment of Egypt, the punishment of all nations that don't come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, tab Tabernaculum, you know, the little huts that they were to stay in. One of the things that I think is worth bearing in mind at this point and you have this scripture, which is interesting. You have Exodus, the 12th chapter, which is also very powerful in this regard. There are not two ways to worship God, one for the Gentiles and one for the Jews. There is one way. The original commandment says, all of you people who are Israelite born will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This was not in intended to be exclusive in the sense that no one else would ever have to. That is plain from Zechariah. That is one that you should have no difficulty with at all. What it is saying that anyone who is going to worship God is going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The same thing is true of Passover in Exodus 12, where it says that no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Well, that's fine. You're not allowed to do it. Well, what are you supposed to do then if you're, you can't eat of it? You're supposed to be circumcised and keep it. The fact is that these other nations were not worshiping God at all. The way of worship of God, God had not revealed himself to the Egyptians. God hadn't shown himself to the Ethiopians. God hadn't established his way of life among the Chinese, among the Eastern peoples, among whoever else there might be in the world. He had established it among all who were Israelite born. Consequently, these commandments given to them are given to them in these ways. They were his people. He was their God. Anyone who is going to adopt the God of Israel or be adopted by him must also adopt 
his ways. One of those ways is to keep the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, to live in huts, whatever that is. And the general meaning of it is simply a temporary dwelling, not your home, not your normal place of, of living. Now back to Leviticus 23 again. The reason. What is remarkable about this, and there is something I think that is very remarkable, and he says you are to live in booths uh, seven days. Let's turn back to Exodus rather than going to Leviticus again. Exodus 25 this time, and beginning in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that gives it willingly. With his heart, you're taking my offering. Now, this is a special offering that's being made at this time. This is the offering you shall take of them, gold, silver, and brass, blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. These are kind of, first of all, we deal with metals. Now we are dealing with fabrics. Then we're dealing with skins, ram skins, dyed red, badger skins, shittim wood. Now we go to wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, sweet in, uh, incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, that I may live among them. What was God going to call this sanctuary, his dwelling place, his place where he was going to be? He continues in verse 9, According to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle, that is the way you're going to make this thing. God's dwelling was the tabernacle. Now, this is not the word for hut, nor is it the word for tent. It is the word which the Revised Standard Version will translate tabernacle. And what it essentially means is a dwelling or a habitation, that is a place to live. But what happened is that when Israel came out of Egypt, and, and there really is nothing remarkable, the fact that they were going to camp out on the road from Egypt to, to, the Pal to Palestine, to the Promised Land, is there? Well, how else were they going to live? You couldn't, it was no sense in moving 100 miles down the road and stopping and building houses. And then you abandon your houses and go another 100 miles and build some more houses. You were going to camp out, weren't you? Uh, from here to there, that was the whole idea. In one sense of the word, when I go back and I read in Leviticus 23, how it says, I want you to live in these tabernacles or huts for seven days. So that every, all your generations will remember that I made you dwell in huts when I brought you out of the land of Egypt is is really kind of unremarkable. That's what you would expect. And so I was kind of led to wonder, why? And where might that be? But in the process of studying it, I came across this little segment here in Exodus, the 25th chapter. When all Israel is there, and they all have their little huts and their places that they live. They have things laid out and their campfires going. And God says, now, I want you to gather together all these specific materials. And when you get them together, I want you to build me a dwelling. And it's going to have first a tabernacle that is a habitation place. And secondly, it's going to have a tent. Now you will find in the King James Version the expression used over and over again, tabernacle of, of the congregation. The word here is not the same as the word here. You know, it's a different word. That is the word which the Revised Standard Version consists, consistently translates tent. And tabernacle of the congregation is translated tent of meeting because that was the place where men came to meet with God. And so Israel set out, having all of their you know, encampments ordered and where they were supposed to be and how they were supposed to march. They set out to build the tabernacle and the tent of meeting, the place where man would meet with God and the place where God should dwell. And they put all the workmanship together. They made the boards. They polished the boards. They prepared the skins. They sewed things together made the metal fittings and attachments, and they erected it, and they dedicated it. And when they dedicated it, the cloud, which had preceded them out of Egypt, they'd gone all the way, you know, with a cloud leading them by day and a pillar of fire by night. When it was all finished, this cloud descended upon the tabernacle. I'm sorry, upon the tent. But in the tabernacle, that is in the Holy of Holies, there was fire. This is the stuff that science fiction special effects people would have a ball with. The, everything about it must have been incredible to see. For with the incredible light 
the incredible, what they call fire, and somehow they knew that it was there. So I must presume that through the, through the cracks and the, and, and the little chinks or the, the little areas where air might flow through, that there was incredible light, shimmering light like fire that came, came out of the tabernacle. And the t tent of meeting was full of smoke all over the place. must have been a, a hair-raising thing to see. And God had actually decided to camp out with them. And so it was that every place they went, they, the, ta the cloud would come up off the tabernacle. They, they would go in, and the people who were assigned to do so would begin to take down the tent. They would remove the boards. They would put the, the, the staves through the ark that they carried it with. And they would march off down the road in order with the ark carried properly and with all the accoutrements, all of the skins, all the boards, everything in its place. And when they got to a place they were to stop, they stopped. They set up the tabernacle. They took the, the, the boards and they put the tabernacle back together. Then they strung the tent of meeting over the whole thing. And when it was all finished, the smoke, and the, the, that is the cloud, and the fire came back down in the tabernacle again. And these people... Through this period of time of walking and wondering with God, actually were aware that He was camping out with them every night. They pitched His tent. They prepared His place. And He actually let them know that He was there day after day after day. Some camp out, huh? Some Boy Scout encampment when God is right there along with you. Now, through all this, they, they saw miracle on top of miracle on top of miracle. Not only the manifestations of God, not only the Ten Commandments, but they walked dry shot across the bottom of the Red Sea. God gave them manna to eat every day. They, they had the, this peculiar thing that happened where they, they would go out six days and gather manna. On the seventh day, there wasn't any. It was six days and the seventh, there wasn't any. Six days and the seventh, there wasn't any. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they saw this miracle before God. It was something staggering to see. There's another aspect, though, of this whole thing. The line of thought that I mentioned when I started out that was provoked by reading Mr. Armstrong's article. You know, there were not intended to be any significant delays on the journey from Egypt to Israel. They should have been expected to have walked down to somewhere near the Dead Sea, I'm sorry, the Red Sea, have pitched their tents and have waited for the time to cross. God parted the Red Sea. It's all a part of his plan to destroy Pharaoh and all of his armies. They walked dry shod across the bottom of it. They probably pinched, pitched right on the other side of it. They worked their way in successive encampments down the side of Sinai. They went to the place where the Ten Commandments were to be given, and they were there for a little while. They were there for a while to get all the instructions about the Ten Commandments. They were there to get the second set of tablets after the first set of tablets had been destroyed. They had the delay involved in building the tabernacle and the work that was involved in it. And, of course, they had the delay of the ten successive rebellions that they engaged in, which paralyzed them, immobilized them, made them sick, caused all kinds of problems for them, and kept them from making the kind of progress they otherwise might have made. This happened again and again, but still, there was no intent on God's part of there being any significant delay other than the short period of time they were to be at Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and then mount up and head for the Promised Land. That was all there was to be of the time that they were to dwell in booths or huts during that period of time. So they came in the process a little bit late in arriving to the place where they were to scout out the land. And if you'll turn back to Numbers 13, I'd like to point out a couple of things in this area that have very much to do with the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Huts, with the camping out that Israel did over, over time. Remember, they got here later than God would have had them to get here because of their ten successive rebellions that they had engaged in. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I gave to the children of Israel. Of every man of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. All powerful, influential men, they were sent to spy out the land. They were to go up in the mountains. They were to creep up on the cities. They were to look at the crops. They were to look at the cattle. They were to, 
to spy out the armies. They were to prepare themselves to come in and take the land. It was God's intent that these men would go down there, spy out the land, come back and bring back a report of how good the land was, and that the children of Israel would immediately take arms and under his direction march in and take the land. And what did they see? I don't know what to make of this, this thing. It says they, they came into the land and they found it a land of milk and honey, a rich, verdant, fertile land. And that they found one cluster of grapes that they actually had to place on a staff and carry back between two men. You know, that's mind-boggling. I, I don't know uh, if those were big grapes or just a big bunch of grapes or a big bunch of a bunch of grapes. It, 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 as I say, it, it kind of staggers the mind to think of it. But the whole idea is of a land that is incredibly rich. Now there also happen to be in this land some rather large men. But the report begins in verse 26 of Numbers, the 13th chapter. Under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We come into the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. And this... This is the produce. Look at what we have brought back. Nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. I presume from the context, the children of Anak were extremely large men. They were giants of a sort. The Amalekites, he said, dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. Now Caleb, at this point of time, stood up and stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. Let's go up immediately. Let's seize the day. Let's do it now. Let's go up and, get it and, and seize this land, for we are well able to overcome it. The time is now. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we are. Now, no one had suggested that they weren't. There was no argument about that. When Caleb got up and made his speech, he was making his speech with an assumption in mind. He assumed that God Almighty would be going into the land with them. He assumed that as they went on the march, the ark would go along with them. He assumed that the cloud and the pillar of fire would be there. He assumed that God would fight for them against their enemies. And he said, let's go up. After all, God had camped with them every night. Why would they assume he would not go with them into battle? They said, they are stronger with me than, than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land. This means evil not merely in the sense of a, a report that the land was evil or that the battle was hard, but that the report was evil. That it was evil of them to bring the kind of report that they brought. It says they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched into, uh, unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of a great stature. Now all of a sudden we're getting a different view. The land eats up the inhabitants thereof. And yet at the same time we're being told that the inhabitants of it are strong, mighty men. These men for whatever reason, because they're motiv motivated by whatever fear, took what they had seen and put a spin on it and gave that message back to the people in such a way that it generated a very negative response. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight like grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept all night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation and said to them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt. Would God we have died in this wilderness. You know, when people start saying, Would God I had died, you really do wonder, you know, well, what's the worst thing that's going to happen to you going up here and fighting these giants? You're going to die. If that's what you really want, let's go get to it. Won't we'll talk about, would God I had died. If you would God you had died, well, would God, let's go do it. Because that's what's involved. 
Wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let's make us a captain, and let's return to Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell flat on their faces in front of the whole congregation. Joshua the son of Nun, Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, tore their clothes. Now mind you, they were not dealing with mere politics in their own mind. What they heard, what they perceived that they heard, was blasphemous. Not just a bad report, not just a minority report or a majority report that differed from their minority report. It was blasphemous. They tore their clothes. Why blasphemous? Because what the men were saying was, God is not with us. All of the works, all of the miracles, all of the signs, all the things we have experienced, we negate all those. We wish we had stayed in Egypt in the first place. We wish we just stayed there and grown old there and died there and been buried there and we've not, not gone through any of this stuff. It was better for us there than it is here. Well, Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes and they spoke to the company of the children of Israel saying, the land through which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. This isn't just good land, it's exceeding good land. If the Lord delights in us, he'll bring us to this land. He will give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. But don't rebel against God because that's what they heard. God brought them all this way to enter the land. And they said, we won't go. And he says, don't rebel against God. Don't fear the people of the land. They are bread for us. We will eat them up. We can tear them up. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But the congregation bade stone them with stones. They wanted to kill them. The Lord said to Moses, how long are these people going to provoke me? I, 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 how long? They told Moses, just let me alone. I'm going to go ahead and send a pestilence among them. I'm going to kill them off. And I'm going to start all over again with you. And Moses said, no, you do that, the Egyptians are going to hear of it. And your name will be blasphemed and people will ridicule. That's not what you brought these people out here for. And God said, all right. He says, pardon, Moses speaking in verse 19, pardon, I beseech you, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of your mercy, and to the greatness, according to the greatness of your mercy, and as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. He reminds him of the fact that he has forgiven them all the way from Egypt to this point. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be full of the glory of the Lord, because all those men that have seen my glory, and they have seen my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not listened to my voice, surely they will not see the land which I swore to their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Caleb, because he had another spirit, because he followed me fully, him I will bring into the land where he went to possess it. Verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. They said, would God we had died in the wilderness. He said, very well. You have pronounced sentence upon yourself. You will die in this wilderness. All that were numbered of you, according to the whole number, from 20 years old and upward, who have murmured against me. Doubtless, he said, you shall not come into the land concerning which I swore to make you dwell therein. Only Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nuns. Now, your little one. Those little children running around here whom you said would become a prey, that those people would be a prey, these little children are the ones who are going to inherit the land. I'm going to take them into the land which you despised. You looked down your nose at it. You said it's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. You didn't like what I brought you to. All right, these little children will have it. 
As for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses are wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even forty days, every day for a year, you will bear your iniquity, even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. You know, when they started out of Egypt, how many days did they have to look forward to of living in huts? 365? 600? Maybe 1,200? How long would it have taken them if they had done what they had been told, if they had followed with God, if they had been faithful to him, to have entered and possessed the land and planted crops and build houses and settle down to raise their children and see their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and to grow old in the land. Not long. But you see, the time that they wound up living in huts turned out to be 40 long years. Some of those people lived in huts the rest of their lives. Why? Why? Why did it happen to them? The answer is so simple and so plain and so easy to understand. It happened because after having seen miracle after miracle after miracle, after having had God camp out with them night after night after night, after having seen manifestations of his glory, after having been fed miraculously by him, after having been saved from the Egyptians, after having seen the Egyptians drown in the Red Sea, after having walked dry shod across the bottom of the Red Sea, seeing the wall, the water like a wall on both sides of them, having made sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, having endured hardship upon top of hardship, when they come right to the border of the land, when the time is there to cross Jordan and take the land, they wouldn't go. Why? Because they didn't believe God. And you do wonder, don't you, sometimes, what does it take? I can see God throwing up his hands and saying, what does it take? What do I have to show them? And I think, when I think of all this, of what it means, and I ask myself, how long do I want to live in huts? How long do I want to live in tabernacles? How long do I want to go on? Do I want to grow old and die in them? Do I want to, do I, and of course the symbolism of crossing Jordan, the symbolism of entering the promised land is not lost on any of us, is it? Wonder why in the New Testament Paul says all those things happen to them for examples upon us upon whom the ends of the world are come, that they face these things, they failed right on the border because they wouldn't seize the day. Caleb says, let's do it. Let's do it now. Let's go. We can take them. They're ours. They're bread for us. Let's go. And they whined and murmured and wept and cried when they had had a whole line of miracles that had finally led them to the place where they were. I, the Lord, verse 35, he says, have said it and I will do it to all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in the wilderness, they will be consumed. There they will die. The men whom Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander on the land. That tells you something there about the, the, the report. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord except, of course, for Joshua and Caleb. After all this, we're told the people mourned greatly. And they decided, we'll change our mind. And they came up to the mountaintop and they said, well, we're going to go up and fight after all. And Moses says, no, no. No, you're not. You're going to turn around and you're going to go back into the wilderness. They said, no, we'll fight. And Moses says, don't do it. So they had to try it anyway, but God was not with them. And they were defeated. The minority report, I guess, turned out to be right after all, but it was right only because they went up without God. 
There is a commentary on all this in the New Testament. I want you to turn back to the third chapter of Hebrews. Without knowing any of this or without, you know, having an awareness or a feeling for what took place back here, a lot of people in reading through Hebrews fail to miss, fail to understand what's happening. It's Hebrews, the third chapter, where this is uh, gone into at some length. Actually, the third and the fourth chapters. But in Hebrews, chapter 3, and I think we begin in uh, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of the provocation, or the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and I said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. These people are just determined, he said, to do wrong. They just have not known my ways. Now, bear in mind, they had seen it. They had seen God's works. They had seen miracles. They had had God camping out with them, and they still didn't know his ways. God has ways. He has ways of doing things. He has a way of worship. He has a way of living. He has a way he wants us to live. He has a way he reacts, a way he deals. He said, these people don't know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Rest. This word is thrown in here. The readers are expected to understand what he meant. He meant they will not cross Jordan. They will not enter the promised land. They will not have a rest from this living in booths, this living in huts, this camping out perpetually for 40 long years. They're just not going to do it. They're going to die after that long camp out and still not be able to enter the land. How would you like to have God Almighty himself raise his right hand up high and swear that you're not going to inherit? Can you depend on his word? You bet you can depend on his word. So that's what he did. He swore that he would never allow these people to enter the land, and they did not. Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest anyone be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You're living in a world, there's sin everywhere, and you encounter it no matter which way you turn. And there is a great temptation as time goes on for us to harden ourselves to it and to become callous and get used to it and, and not be disturbed by the sin that exists around us on every side. And we get to the place because evil is abounding and because people are doing the things they do that we think, well, maybe God doesn't know and maybe God doesn't care. And then we come up against the day. The day. Today, he says, hear his voice and don't harden your hearts. And when we come up against the day, we are not able to believe. You know, it hurts when people won't accept your word, doesn't it? I mean, here you are, you've, you've never lied to this guy in all your life, you've been, you know, or this, this person, and you've been, had, feel you've had every rep, re reason to have a good reputation and for your word to be worth something, and you say, this is the way it is, and then that person will look right back at you and say, well, I, you know, I just don't believe you. I just can't accept what you're telling me. It hurts. It's in, in a way, when people do not believe you, when there is every reason in the world why they should take your word for it or accept your word, it's, it's a slap in the face. It's an insult. And here, here is God who has never given these people one moment's reason to doubt his word, who has given them every reason in the world to believe that he will do what he said he will do, who has given them every reason to believe that adding one more miracle on top of what already has been done is no problem, and they just would not take his word for it. Do we understand the relationship in the Bible, in New Testament theology, between unbelief and disobedience. They are so intertwined that it's almost impossible sometimes to sort out what it is you're, which of them it is you're dealing with at a moment of time. Because unbelief inevitably leads to disobedience. Because sooner or later, you are going to come up against a question of obedience to God, 
where you're going to have to believe him. You're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to believe that his way is right. Or you're going to have to believe like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if it costs me my life, I'm doing it anyway because of God's word. You're going to come up against that. Sooner or later, you are. Will you believe? Will you trust? Will you obey? Because that is what this is all about. He said, we are made, verse 14, partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. What a terrible thing it is to think of all the months of hardship and all the sacrifice and all the things that had been done to these men who when it came to the last day, the day, the kickoff day, the day of crossing over, the day of invading the land, the day that, that put them over and into the promised land, that one day short, they wouldn't do that one more thing that God was asking of them. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts like they did in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Not everyone that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Who was it he was angry with for 40 years? Who was it that he never relented and would never allow them to enter into the promised land? Was it not with those that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter into his rest? But those who would not believe, wouldn't trust, would not obey, would not go along with him. You know, it's a little difficult sometimes to get your mind around the question of belief and obedience and trust. And I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what your, you know, Jordan River is. I don't know what it is that you're facing or what it is that you have to cross. But isn't it a shame to think of having made sacrifices, having done without, having had been actually done some, had suffered loss to in order to be obedient to God and having seen God's hand in your own life and having known that he is and having had prayers answered and, and being aware that God can do the things that you need to have done. That you would quit one day short or one minute short or one miracle short or one act of obedience short of whatever it is that God would have you to do. The writer of Hebrews goes on saying, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left any of us of entering into his rest, any of us should seem to come short of it. What a shame that we would not all of us be able to, to do it together. For unto us was a gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached didn't help them a bit because it wasn't mingled with faith in them that heard it. I want to tell you something, folks, about faith. I'm afraid we spend a lot of our times wishing for faith, just hoping for faith. And maybe someday I'll have faith. And maybe someday I'll find some strength and have the faith for this or the faith for that. I've got news for you. Faith does not exist in the absence of fear. You do understand that, don't you? If you're not afraid, you don't need faith. If you have it, if it's in your hand, you don't need faith. If I've got an army of 5,000 facing an army of 300, I don't need faith. You need faith when you've got the army of 300 facing the 5,000. That's when you need faith. You need faith when you have every reason in the world to be afraid. You need faith when you have every reason in the world to believe it's not going to happen. You need faith at times like this. And do you know what faith is? Faith is coming to grips with the fact of your fear and of saying like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, well, I may die. They did not, they, they believed that God would save them, but they weren't sure. They weren't sure at all. What they had was conviction. The conviction was, even if you do kill us, even if we do die, be it known to you, O king, we will not bow down and worship your idol. Faith is not so much a feeling as it is a decision. They did not have to be unafraid, the Israelites didn't. 
They just had to trust God. They didn't have to be sure of the outcome. All they had to do was go up the hill, weapon in hand, when they were told to go. All they had to do was seize the day. The outcome was in hands much greater than theirs. These men, as I said, did not survive the time of living in huts. There is a day for every one of us. There is a, a Jordan River to cross. And I wonder, as I asked you earlier, how long do we want to live in huts? How long are we going to not obey God? How long, you see, and here we come to this funny little pair of words. Trust and obey. And our difficulty in getting them apart, you just can't. Because somewhere down the line, in the face of fear, in the face of all kinds of doubts, in the face of everything wondering how in the world it will come out, you're going to have to come to grips with it and say, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Though I lose my life, I am going to obey. Though I lose the battle, I intend to fight. And I believe that God is with me. How long do we plan to live in tabernacles?